Um, and of course, we'll receive our email Tuesday, Monday night, Tuesday, for our uh, Bible study on Zoom at 6 p.m. And then on Monday the 15th, the uh, which is that will be tomorrow. Uh, it say food bank. Yeah, food bank tomorrow night. 5 p.m. volunteers needed uh, at 3.30 for all of those that can make it. And there's our show of Tuesday we're just talking about. The 20th, the women's uh, B&B at Parsonage. Discussion will be on Miriam, Moses' sister. And uh, continuing this month in February, the non but hygiene night, far so etc. And let's see, 15 plus 14 plus 7 is 21. Dave Bunk. We already sang it last week. Down, I, downstairs. Did, did, yes, did, did you did. hear that last week? I, um, the, I don't think it's on here, but the 19th, the 19th is, so the 19th the 19th is, is um, Good, good Shepherd. shepherd bank pickup. And it's a pretty good sized load, so we can use any uh, yeah. anyone that's available. Okay. To help. Yeah, it was in the bulletin last week. The, what has happened is, is Good Shepherd has had me pin down a date for the USDA stuff coming in, and it's every third Friday. Well, it doesn't necessarily coincide with our food banks on distribution. So that's why it's an odd day. So we're actually going to have Good Shepherd pick up the next two weeks in a row. Exactly. Yeah. Got it. So this, this week, this Friday is a big load. Yeah. yeah. And that is a big blow relative to the speak. USDA stuff. That's why. Speak up a little bit. She's trying to take notes on Ah. Well, I'll, I'll get it. So, so we got that 19th Good Shepherd. And then tomorrow night is, is our uh, distribution from the food bank. Volunteers needed at 3 30. Shrove Tuesday evening. Cancel. Cancel. Okay. Yeah. 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 20th. We don't know, still good. Yes, ma'am. It's not in the bulletin because I haven't really advertised it, but on Wednesday, weather permitting, uh, we're having um, our young people get together for a day uh, here at the church. Um, we're going to do some cooking, we're going to see a movie, we're going to talk about church. And so just pray about it. Pray about it. So, yeah, it's pretty, I expect five or six. And the weather is going to be fine because it's going to be just the way it is. Just going to be fine. I have decided. <laughs> Garden torpedoes. I pray lots. Why don't you just decide that we're not going to get the storm at all then? That would be nice. I know. The shoveling stuff, up, I'm done with it. The shoveling, yeah. I'm done. I don't, even if it's been yeah, a nice yeah. winter, I'm done with it. So. But be uh, praying for that, please. Maestro, could we, you know, he has a disclaimer. I think we should, uh, oh, the guy that's only three months. Go in the little pipe here. Oh, David. Oh. He makes grass grow on the hills. 
He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of the man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him, in all those who hope in his steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion, for he strengthens the bars of your gates. He blesses your children within you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this morning, we're going to uh, turn to page 145. We're going to sing uh, 146, I worship you, Almighty God, and 147, how great thou art. But I was thinking, coming in this morning, um, I want to sing a chorus. I asked Deb, she couldn't find her adopt, so we're going to sing it Acapulco. I mean, Acapulco. <laughs> and if you know it, it's um, God can do anything but fail. Hopefully you know it. You did? Okay, if you've got it, then I'm going to let you play it. If not... That is not it. It is. I apologize. Thank you. 
Father, we thank you this morning that we can be here in your house. And we pray that by your grace and your mercy and how awesome you are, that you would allow us to worship you in spirit and in truth. Father, let us come before you now in your majesty and praise you and honor you. We are here this morning because of your son, Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus that taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is a 
testimony of a life changed in Jesus Christ. And I'd like to give you that copy. So I think I'll get more copies out here, by the way, Barb. You'll have your copy in dead. Well, I left one for dead. Anyways, if you read the story, it's an easy read. It's, he's, he's not a great writer and author. And he's a businessman who's been through some ups and downs. But what God did in his life is unbelievable. If you read it and you like it, pass it on. If you want another copy, I will get you another copy. I have plenty of them. And you can give it to someone else. I want you to share it. All it is is something that we need to hear once in a while. We need to hear about the joy in people's lives when God changes them. That's called, the old people in the old church used to call that a testimony. We're testifying of the work that God did in our lives. And this is an exciting story. I'd like to, and it's, what's the title? Look at the title, Change. And that's what it's all about, being changed from what we used to be to what we are now. That's what Jesus does in our life. So that's the missions moments this morning. Take that book, read it for me. It won't take you long, unless you're a slow reader like Dave is. It'll probably take him to his next birthday. But you can take your time and read it. And as soon as you're done, you can read it in, in an hour and hang it on to someone else and give it to them. And if you like it, come to me and I'll get you another copy. How's that sound? And you pass that on. Pass it along. Thank you. I can agree, because I have read it. It didn't take me a year. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very short read. It's very a very good story. So it's uh, really it enlightened me, for sure. Uh, Our responsive reading this morning is found in your bulletin. It's taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verses 29 to 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the house of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in the and the So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and even possessed. The whole town gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in this synagogue, Let's turn in our blue book, a little blue book, hopefully there's one in your, your row and enough for everyone to have one. Page 163, Shout to the North. Yeah, I know, we should have Ruth up front, she loves to do, but I won't. I won't. You can. Um, Anyways, let's stand and sing together. <coughs>
say we worship God, it doesn't do anything for us. If we just say God, it's a God thing, that doesn't do anything for us. Mike likes to quote me all the time because I keep telling him, and he's got it in his head, it's a Jesus thing. See, Jesus said in John 14, 6, no one comes to the Father. No one comes to God. But by me. And there are people in this world, there are religious people in this world, there are people who go to all types of other churches that would say to you, well, that's being a little like blinders on you. You, you Baptist. It's not Baptist. It's the same Bible you use. It isn't Methodist. It's the same Bible you use. It isn't Episcopalian. It's not even Catholic. It's the same Bible. We have one Bible. There are a few different translations. There's one that's heretical. That's the Jehovah's Witnesses. They change something that's very important in John 1 1, calling Jesus a God and not the God. But it's the same Bible. So for re another church or another denomination to make that argument, I look at them like, really? It was a president who was famous for saying, in my church, we don't call it born again. Well, the church didn't call him born again. Jesus did. Jesus in John 3 said, except a man be born again. I don't know what church he went to. Actually, I did, but I don't want to mention the president or the church. When we look at this, I come to you humbly because I, I, I don't consider myself any good preacher. What I do is I come to you with the passion that God has put in my heart when he changed me. When I met Jesus. And as we look at God's word in the scriptures, and you know, I've gone back to school and I've worked hard, hard at it. Deb knows. Even Deb and John back there know because I spent a lot of years of working to get a degree. And, and it was hard. But that didn't mean anything. You can put all kinds of knowledge. You can know all things about the Bible. But it doesn't do a thing for you if you haven't had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And know Him as your personal Savior. It doesn't mean a thing. None of it means anything. And that same Bible teaches us that. Today, as we go into God's Word, I want us to look at what I call this sermon, Shout for Joy. We just, we just heard this song. This, we sang, Shout! to the north and the south. Shout to the east and the west. 
Shout that I know Christ and I know God. So I tell people who don't like the fact that Jesus said, I am the only way, not to argue with me. <laughs> you, want, you want to argue with somebody? Argue with Jesus. He said it. I believe it. For me, that settles it. You want to argue with somebody? Argue with Jesus. Good luck. <laughs> you know? Let's look at, we're in chapter, we're going to cover both of these chapters. I'm going to give you four points from both chapters, and I want you to really, if you can, grab hold of this. Um, I'm going to go into just the first three verses of chapter 54, and we're going to pray for a moment. Chapter 54, sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitation be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread abroad to the right and to the left. And your offspring will possess the nations and will people the desolate cities. Let's speak to the Father for a moment if we may. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. As, as I pray week after week, as we come to this place and at this point in the service, we believe this is the truth revealed of what you want us to know. Father, we know your word also says that the secret things belong to you, but the revealed things belong to us and our generations. Father, show us something fresh this morning. Give us something new, something clear. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, I will address these first verses as the church. We see this as the church, a picture of the church of Christ. And then I'll come back to explaining that a little bit. On May 30th, 1792, at the Friar Lane Meeting House, Nottingham, England, William Carey preached an impassioned sermon on Isaiah 54, 2 and 3. These verses. He preached to a small group of local Baptist ministers. And Baptist ministers were a little rare at that time in England, in Nottingham, and they've only been around about 100 years, a little more in that area. They were called dissenters at one time. But he rammed his sermon home with a pair of phrases that have been ringing ever since. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. Think about that. Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. On October 2nd of that same year, 1792, he followed up his appeal and these village pastors started the particular Baptist Society for the propagation of the gospel among the heathen. <laughs> Later, they shortened it to the Baptist Missionary Society. I'm sure they're glad they did. I think that was just a little bit more to put on a letterhead, you know? It was just a lot to write up there. Anyways, he understood, by the way. Carrie understood. I want to say this again. Carrie understood this sign. Reach teach and sin. Those Baptist ministers back in the 1700s in Nottingham, England understood what it meant to reach, teach, and send. Just a little background on William Carey. He had some hardships. He had a lot of hardships in his life. Um, that Baptist Missionary Society made him one of the first missionaries. He wasn't the first, it was two of them, but one of the first two to go to India from that board. They sent him to India. He outlived three wives, 
I don't think he outlived the third one, but he outlived two of them. He had three wives. They died. The hardship of going there was awful because when he, the ship left England to go there, they heard he was going. And they told the captain, the English tea company, told him he can't go. And they put him off at the Isle of Wight. And they had to stay there until they got another ship to come along. And I think it was a French ship, I'm not sure now, or Dutch. It was Dutch. And the Dutch ship had to take him because the English wouldn't. Because they were afraid he was going to cause trouble being a missionary in India. Preaching the word, just leave things as they are. We don't need to proselytize these people. See, he was attempting great things for God. And as he went, he had to go into an area that was run by the Dutch and not the English. And one after another came to follow him and help him to work, and people died, and, and they, some of them didn't last, but just a short time, back in the 17 into the early 1800s. And it was a tough work. But he had a joy in his heart knowing God and understanding this scripture about the church that made him go and preach the gospel and to tell people about Jesus Christ. Bishop Leslie Newbigin, who was an Anglican bishop, a fantastic writer, um, very influential in my own life as I studied him for school, when he was 88 years old, he had been a bishop in India for a long time, most of his career. He got up at 88 and began a talk with the words, mission, through these doors as you enter the mission field, reach, teach, and send. He got up with the words, mission begins with an explosion of joy. Of joy. You want to go tell somebody what you heard. I don't want to go into it this morning, um, but if you took the fourth chapter of the book of John, the gospel, Jesus told the woman at the well. He told her all about her, and she realized who she was talking to. And what did she do? She became a missionary. She ran into town. He says, you got to see this guy. He's the guy. He's the one, come on, and brought the whole crowd out. She had an explosion of joy. Can you describe for me this morning when you have been overcome with the joy of knowing God in the midst of maybe sorrow or maybe in the midst of great things? So many of us cry out to God when we are have a problem. I've listened to people in New York City for years. I can't pay the rent this Thursday. Well, I need a job. We're hungry. But how many times do we praise God in the good times? Wow, Lord, things are great. Things are wonderful in my life. Thank you. Thank you for how nice it is. How wonderful things are. How often do we do that? But when was the last time you experienced joy? Real joy. Our text today says, it starts with shout. <laughs> it says shout, and he's really talking to the church that Jesus Christ is going to bring in. The kingdom is coming, and he's talking about it. He says, shout out for joy, and you should be happy because this is the promise made. I'm making you a promise that your tents will have to get better. You, you're going to have to stretch out your cords. You know, he, he was talking to the Bedouin. The Bedouin understood. They had, if you've ever, one of my favorite all-time movies. I have a list of favorite movies. Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, the music and the, and the photography. And, and Lawrence became native. He became like a, an Arab Bedouin. And he's out there in the desert. But to see the tents, you know, that they have these great big tents the sheep would have. They take those things up and put them down. Well, here he's saying to the Bedouin, your tent's going to have to get bigger. And this is a prophecy for the church dealing with the fulfillment of the prophecy to Abraham, having many descendants, and the kingship, the throne of David, forever in the servant Jesus Christ. And in that kingdom and in that many descendants that no one birthed, 
You didn't have, you only have barren women, but you're still going to have more kids. You're going to cover the earth. He says that here. Go, go back to the text with me. Look here. In verse uh, verse 1, single barren one who did not bear, bring forth, break forth into singing and crying aloud, and you have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. The church, and Israel is still Israel, but Israel is by natural descent now out of Abraham, that's the seed to Abraham. But the many deceived, the seeds that are spiritual, that's the world, that's all of us, we're, the, the church is bigger than Israel. Enlarge the place of your tent. In other words, he's talking about getting a bigger territory. So wherever you squatted yourself with your tent, make it a little bigger area because you're going to have to make that tent a lot bigger. And let the curtains of your habitation, verse 2, be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords. In other words, the tents are going to get so big, they're going to have to put more cords on them. Make them longer so that they can grab the pegs in the ground. And he says, for you spread abroad to the right, verse 3, and to the left, and your offspring will possess the nations. Where do you go in the world unless it's forbidden? And I believe there's people there that it still are. Where do you go in the, nation, in, the, in the nations of the world? Where do you go where there's not Christians? And even Jews? Where do you go? Even in countries that it's against the law to be a Christian. Miramar just had a revolution. And Miramar closed off that country to Christianity for a long time. But you know what? There's a thriving Baptist church in Miramar. In fact, one of the people on the government has been under threat lately, and I get these emails, is a believer. So where do you go? And that's what we see here a picture of. Spread out! Spread out and sing about it. Sing about it. Verse 4, fear not, for you will not be ashamed. Be not confounded, for you will not be disgraced. For you will forget the name of your youth and the reproach of your widowhood. You will remember no more. When the early church started, what happened? It ran through all kinds of problems. People wanted to were eradicated. They wanted to kill the people. They wanted to get rid of them. They wanted to, we got to get rid of this church. They're against the, 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 the um, emperor. We can't have this. Get rid of these guys. We forget some of those people that were there 2,000 years ago beginning the church. I, I, my, my best friend, uh, he, uh, and I've used, I've told you this before, Chucky, he says, John, I don't know about coming to church. He said, I wasn't in church for two weeks. And I show up to church. Everybody's asking me where I've been. He said, I don't like that. He said, I'm, what, are they keeping tabs on me? They're following me around? And remember my answer to him? I said, Chucky, get it. No, no, no. Chucky, you got to understand this. This goes back 2,000 years to the early church. Because we didn't know what happened to somebody if they didn't show up to church for a couple of weeks. They could have been in the catacombs. They could have been in the circus. Remember the circus where they fed Christians to the lions? Remember Nero would hang up people and, for his barbecue and light them up, light them on fire? I know we don't want to hear that, but guess what? That's what they did to the church. And guess what? Where do you go today? The problem with the church today is we have too many divisions and too many people and we built too many walls around ourselves. And I can't talk to him, I can't talk to her, and that one's done, and we, we keep. And guess what that goes against? That totally goes against Scripture. Because in the high priestly prayer of John 17, Jesus prayed that they would be one, like you and I are one Father. Or anything but one. So in these first 10 verses of chapter 54, the cry here is for the people to sing. And Zion is seen here with the patriarchal Im image of the tent that the patriarchs did, these Bedouins. And it's pictured as a mother who has been blessed with many children. Zion, which is the church, will need a spacious tent in this translation here, in this understanding of the prophecy. They had to take measures to increase the size 
other tents. So this morning I can say to you, we can see this as a picture of the church to prepare for the great increase in her sons. The church is to enlarge the place of her habitation. The idea of the tent may be intended to suggest that the church, listen loved ones, that the church has no permanent home on this world, but like the no man, we are traveling until we reach the heavenly city. Because what is Philippians 3.20 says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, are there moments when you feel in your life you're told to sing for joy. You belong to the church. You're a member or not a member. You show up or you don't show up. I tell people when they complain about church, they said, it doesn't matter what church you go to because it doesn't matter what church you stay home from. You know? So anyways, I, 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 are there moments when you feel like, is this all there is? Is this all there is? Really? Is this all it is? You wonder, where is the joy, don't you? You must. Let me tell you a secret about pastors. Not all, but a lot. They quit on Monday morning. They quit on Monday morning, Monday after Monday. I'm done with this stuff. <laughs> I don't want to put up with these people, with these things. I'm done. Sometimes the joy just gets sucked out like the hot heat. I remember the first time I was in Haiti, I got off the plane, it was 100 and something degrees. We were on this beautiful American Airlines air conditioned plane and the, the door opened and I walked down that, and that heat just, it felt like someone threw me in a dryer at the laundromat. And I was, I, man, it just sucked the air right out of me. You ever feel like that? Many a day, many a day. But guess what? God gives great joy. God has provided joy for me. Because he reminds me that my job, or any pastor's job, is to get the church to understand that it is to enlarge the place where her tents are located. So here we are to grow. We are to tell other people. We're to reach, teach, and sin. We're to expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. And that's what we are seeing here as Isaiah is talking to the nation and, I pray, to us as a church. The Lord promises a large increase, but the church is to spare no labor. Listen, loved ones, listen, friends, listen to these words. The church is to spare no labor in obedience to these commands. We're to be, we are to be obedient to God's word. I can show you a lot of churches nowadays where anything goes. A couple of years ago, I had to deal with that with, one, with a church down on the coast. We don't care what you're telling us. This is what we're going to do. Something that was ungodly. We don't care. God's word has changed. No, it hasn't. We see it differently. You shouldn't. Hello? I make the joke about my sister. It's in perception. My sister Joanne, I always tease her. I say, she wonders why, and you've heard me say this, I have seven sisters and she only has six. <laughs> it's all in your perception, you know? If you don't look at things right, you're going to see them wrongly. So here, Isaiah is saying to the church and to us that we, we need to get up. And, and the fact that he's going to take care of us, that alone should cause you joy. You should get giddy. Remember my friend Ray Tompkins called me up, and, and I told you about him, Ray says, Hey, John, I accepted the Lord Jesus Christ last night as my Savior. I went to a service at the great big church with about 400 people in Prescott, Isle, and he said they wanted... People, if you want to believe in Jesus, just say you do it. He says, I said, I did. And he said, man, I'm giddy. And remember my response? I did it 50 some years ago and over 50 years ago. And I'm giddy still. I'm excited. And if you're not, 
You know, I, if, I, if I took a survey and said, are you excited about knowing Jesus? And you go, yes, you know what I'm, what I'm going to tell you. Then tell your face. <laughs> if you're excited about being part of what Christ has for you, tell your face. Show the joy. Show the excitement. The church isn't, you remember, where are you going? I'm over to Clifton Baptist this morning. Oh, it's Sunday. I gotta go to church. Whoa! Man, I wouldn't want to go on that horse ride. Come on, what boring stuff. We need to be excited. And Isaiah's here saying, shout! Get excited. Get to understand. Let's look at verses 11 to 17. A promise kept. See, he makes the promise he's going to enlarge us. Let's see how he keeps it. Because we're going to see a picture here of him as the builder. We see the Lord as a builder in, in these verses. So in 11, he says, O afflicted one, storm-tossed and not comforted, behold, I will set your stones in antimony, which is really, does anybody know what that is? Turquoise. Turquoise. Why they didn't put turquoise, I don't know. <laughs> and lay your foundations with sapphires. I will make your pinnacles of agate, your gates of carnivals, and on your wall of precious stones. And you, all your children should be, listen to this, listen to this 12th verse, uh, 13th verse, excuse me. All your children should be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Think about that. In righteousness, verse 14, you shall be established, you shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror you shall not, it shall not come near you. These, these words here, it's God who is doing this. God is the builder. And he's saying, I'm going to keep my promise. So the promise made is that we're going to grow. The promise kept is by God himself. We have the presence of God's Holy Spirit in our lives today. Paul says, the minute you said, the minute the light bulb comes on, the minute you have that four great idea, you know the light bulb lighting on over your head? That once you have that epiphany, that Jesus is the Christ. Once you realize that Jesus is the real deal, and you say, you know what? I believe this. That moment, Paul says, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, comes to reside in you. It's, it's a miracle. How can we not be happy? God says, I'm hanging out with you by my Holy Spirit. I have come with my presence in your life. God's with us. By the way, I just wanted to tell you, if you're not good at math, I'm going to give you some math. You and God are a majority. When all the world is going crazy, you and God are a majority. Lord, thank you. I got you right now. He, and he, he's telling, telling us, I got you. <laughs> you know, I, I always tell people, if you got that old saying, God is my co-pilot, you know what I tell you? Switch seats. <laughs> Let God drive. You, you just sit there and watch. He'll do a better job than you will. Guaranteed. And he's making that promise here, and he's going to keep that promise. So it's a promise kept. And he says, I'm going to give you this new city. Think about Revelation 21.9. Let me read it for you. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. In verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. He's the builder. Not you and I. In fact, they say, you want to see beauty, the great, you know, you can see the Taj Mahal and, and things like that. Um, but the walkway to the famous Ishtar Gate in Babylon was lined with intricate patterns with the background made by blue glazed bricks that gave the appearance of lapis. Lapis, if you remember when I was early in Isaiah, that was a, a, a stone, it was a blue stone that was really, really desired in the Middle East. And in fact, Israel was going to go down and make some treaties with Egypt. 
because of the Assyrians coming and they were taking lapis with them and some of that stone, Isaiah told us. And God was questioning him, what are you doing that for? Trust me, not them and what you got. Well, these beautiful gates is supposed to be just unbelievable if you saw the beauty. But you know, sometimes I say, Lord, you've given us a really beautiful place to live here. Heaven, you know, I hear about it, I read about it. But you know what? This is a pretty place. I mean, I, on a, I've seen the Rocky Mountains. I've seen the, the, the waters in the Caribbean when I put my hand in there and just, wow. You'd almost think you were on Hopkins Pond. I put my hand down in, wow. You know? I've seen the beauty of a brand new baby. And, 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 and they've got those little hands that look like miniature catcher's mitts. They haven't formed yet really well, and the fingers, there's no dexterity, and they just, they're just waddling back and forth. And those little, those little stubby feet, those little tiny toes that look like little dots, and that little button nose, and those little eyes. How beautiful. How beautiful. I've been at Fancy Gap, going down into North Carolina, out of Virginia, and you see that. The horizon and the sun coming up in the morning. Wow. I've been in Salt Lake going south, and I can see the darkness and the moon coming up in the east. And I can still see the sun up over the mountains in the, in the west, because I was high enough. But all the beauty I've seen in my life, nothing, nothing compares to the look on someone's face when they understand and come to agree and embrace the fact that Jesus is the Christ. Nothing compares with that. All of life and all of heaven seems to fade when you realize who Jesus is. And God gives us this beautiful place and he says, heaven's going to be better. It's even going to be better. <laughs> Lord, you're amazing me. Keep it up. He's amazing and amazing all the time. It just goes crazy. It's just unbelievable. Verse 13 is, is interesting. God promises peace. There is an old Chinese proverb. And this is what the Chinese proverb says. If you are depressed, you're living in the past. If you're de depressed, you're living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you're at peace, you're living in the present. Could we apply that? Yeah, we could. I'm standing here now not knowing what's ahead. Knowing what I've been forgiven of. But I'm in the presence. Knowing that God loves me and that Jesus Christ is part of my life. John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Jesus says, I'll take care of you. I've got this, he says. In today's 2021 vernacular, I've got this. I, I misspoke when I told the story. We love the hymn. It is well with my soul. When peace like a river attendeth my way. You know, what a, what a wonderful hymn. And, and when I misspoke in the story was that I said, the Spoffords lost almost everything in, in the great Chicago Five. And the next couple of years they rebounded and they were a wealthy family. And Spofford sent his wife to Europe. They were going to spread, spend Christmas in Paris. Tells you they had a lot of money. So they get on the ship in New York, and off they go. And I, I misspoke because the ship went down. And the four daughters were lost. They were from like 11 to 
two, two, 11 to two, four girls. They were lost at sea. The, the crew found Mrs. Spofford later laying on a raft, or laying on a plank, floating in the water, in the fluxum, they call it, in the fluxum, and they rescued her. She sent a telegram back to Chicago. All is lost, I'm, I'm, I'm here. She sent it from the Liverpool on the other side of England. And he rushed, Spofford did, and got on the next boat that he could, and off he went to, to England. The captain called him during the voyage and told him, because they knew the reports of where the point was that that ship went down. And he made a couple of notes. He, some people say he wrote the hymn there. He didn't. But he, he put, everything came to his head, and he said, you know, peace like a river, you know. And it's become a famous poem, all because of those four lives that were lost, those four little girls. They went on to have um, some more children, and only out of seven children, all that lasted was two. They had a son later on, he died of scarlet fever. They had a tough life. And yet he could still sing, it is well with my soul, because he had a peace that God gives. He had a peace that only can come from God. But the music he didn't write, Philip P. Bliss wrote the music. He wrote a few hymns, Keep the Lower Lights Burning and, and a few others, great gospel hymns. Well, Bliss, who wrote that tune, was traveling back east, and they crossed the Ashtabula River, going, I guess, from Chicago and going to Ohio over to Pennsylvania. And the bridge, the trestle, collapsed. And this is the 1800s, and the train fell down in the ravine caught fire, and he got out, couldn't find his wife, and went back in. And in the wreckage and the carnage, they never did find the bodies. Six people now. And millions of people have sunk. It is well with my soul. Only understanding what Christ does in our lives can give you the kind of peace to go through times like that. To go through the hardship. To go through the problems of life. And God says, I will take care of you. Jesus says, I got this. I give you my peace. That's what makes people like William Carey survive a couple of wives and keep working he, he translated the Bible into six languages in India while he was there. People came to help him and he died of sickness. He kept going because he expected great things from God and he wanted to attempt great things for God. Isaiah goes on to tell us in verse 1 of chapter 55. Because I say to you, who is invited to this peace? Who is invited to this promise? Who's invited to this joy? He says, listen to this. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Think about that. The hymn writer writes the hymn so wonderful, simply to thy cross I cling. Why? Because just prior to that he said, to, to thy cross, I, no, I have an empty hand. I have nothing, nothing to, nothing to my, nothing to your cross I bring, simply to your cross I bring. We can't give God anything. And God is saying, come to me, you don't need anything. How many people say, well, I'm going to go to church as soon as I get myself together. Good luck, it ain't going to happen. I wouldn't want to take that bet the days. It ain't going to happen. You cannot get yourself ready for God. You cannot make yourself prepared for God. All you can do is say, here I am, Lord, take me. Here I am. It's either me or you, God. 
Some of you disagree with me on, on the election of the saints. And I was telling somebody just this morning, I used to fight against them. I chose God. I got mad. I get angry. I prayed. Lord, what are you talking about? You foreknew. What are you talking about? I heard a good preacher. It made sense to me, and I chose you. You ever been on one of those game shows where you hear that sound? <laughs> Wrong answer. Jesus says, no one comes to me except the Father and evil. The problem is, how many of us are listening to God's call in our lives? See, we don't know. Softly and tenderly we sing to him, Jesus is calling, calling to you and to me. Come home. And here he says, you're invited. You're invited. He says, come, you don't need anything. You can't get yourselves ready. Don't, don't worry about that. This chapter gives us two points. The first is in these first five verses. He says, in these first five verses, the hungry are invited. Who are the hungry? Hungry people need satisfaction. Who are the hungry? Throughout all history, people have tried to find satisfaction through many things other than God. Look at all the people you've seen in your lives. There's just there's nobody in here ancient except her. And, and let's, let's just think of, of how old you are. And think about your lifetime. Look at the famous people who have ended up dead because of trying to do things to satisfy their lives or looking for the next thrill or the next moment and ended up. You know, when I was a kid, well, I wasn't a kid, but you know, pretty much I was still a kid. John Belushi, I loved him. He could make me laugh no matter what. Drugs. I had pastors who don't think like I do get mad at me because I said Robin Williams wouldn't have been the guy he was but he was chasing the women and the booze and the good time Charlie and none of it satisfied and from one woman to the next and from one get high to the next and nothing was satisfying so I said if he had known Christ and the peace Jesus gives well, no, he had psychological problems. Two pastors wrote that to him. Really? 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 Think of all the people, famous people. Marilyn Monroe. Had everything. Judy Garland. Think of all these actors and famous people that had money and wealth and fame, and they kept looking for something because it doesn't satisfy. We had Mr. Ono. Mr. Ono came to me from, from Japan, Tokyo. He came to New York. I was at the E Free Church in Brooklyn, and uh, I took him on one Sunday afternoon. We took him home. Pastor said to me, John, would you take him home and feed him at your mom's house? I said, sure. Mom always had a big meal, and we fed him. And uh, I took him that afternoon on a car ride all over New York City. We hit all the boroughs and came back to Brooklyn. He, he, he was like this, you know. You, you couldn't see Tokyo that way. But man, we took him everywhere. I got him back home. But he said something to me that I've always kept in my mind. He said, the Japanese think when it comes to food, they all have two stomachs. See, one stomach, you can put any food in there you want to. You can have all your sushi and all that other stuff, you know, if you want to. But the other stomach is only for rice. And unless they have rice and fill that stomach up with rice, they haven't eaten. There's an emptiness there. For every one of us, born under God's Son, there's an emptiness until the peace of Christ comes in and fills it. And if it doesn't, we'll never know peace. Nothing can satisfy except God. He created us that way. We were created in His image. And for those who disagree, well, I, I usually tell them, 
I love you anyways, but my heart's going to break for you. We have learned that joy is more than a sense of the comic, C.S. Lewis once wrote, more than earthly pleasure, and to a believer even more than what we call happiness. Joy is the enjoyment of God and the good things that come from the hand of God. If our freedom in this life, in Christ, is a piece of angel food cake, C.S. Lewis says, joy is the frosting. If the Bible gives the wonderful words of life, joy supplies the music, he says. If the way to heaven turns out to be an arduous, steep climb, joy is the cheer lift. <laughs> Jesus said, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly in John 10.10. 10. Are you enjoying with joy the abundant life God promised you? If not, I ask you why. But here's where it starts at. All are invited. Verse 6. And we're getting ready to close. I know you're waiting. Here we are. Verse, verse 6 of chapter 55. He goes on to say, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Now folks, I'm going to stop right here. And this is where the church makes me give you a legal disclaimer. The, the elders make me give you a legal disclaimer. I'm smiling because the, the, the elders didn't say any such thing. And I shouldn't be smiling because this is a disclaimer. If you don't accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that's your business. But because you've been here today, within the sound of my voice, you can never say you didn't have the opportunity. Amen. And you won't put that burden on this Baptist preacher. Because I'm going to tell you that it's either Christ or nothing. The choice is yours. The choice is yours. And I don't, and I'm not, forgive me, I'm not trying to dangle your feet over hell. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I believe it. That's the only difference. Somebody was talking to me this week and they said, well, you, 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 you just, the way you explain it, you get so involved and you just, yeah, I believe this. I hold to this. Jesus said in John 3, 3, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Have you heard the voice of Jesus calling you to become born again? Romans 2, 4, or do you presume on the riches of the kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? You see, these last verses of chapter 55 are about us repenting and coming back as the church. Matthew 4, 17, from that time Jesus began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was fulfilling the words of Isaiah so many years before. That's why Paul so confidently could say to the church at Ephesus, in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Verse 11, chapter 55 of our text today. So shall my word that goes out from my mouth, it shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. So if you have listened to my voice today, you judge yourself because you can never say, I didn't know. Loved ones, and I, and I mean that. Loved ones, I love you. And, and I'd hate to have anyone 
that I know face a Christless eternity. Think about that today for me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the, the God of the universe. You are the God of all things. And through you and your Son and the presence of your Holy Spirit, there was nothing created that was created. Nothing exists except what you have put in place to exist. Father, I thank you for being my God. I thank you for being our God. And Father, I pray if there's a heart here this morning and a mind that may be questioning, that by your Holy Spirit, softly and tenderly, call them. Call them by name. I pray in the name of Jesus our Lord. As we close this morning, let's turn our hymnals to number 713. It's a, it's a misprint in the, I'm not changing the song. The song title is correct. The number 713. Let's stand and sing together. Father, as we close this service, we pray that the grace, mercy, and peace that fall down from the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would fall upon, that great grace fall upon every child of God. And Father, we know you are Jehovah Jireh, our God and our provider, our Lord and our provider. We ask this morning that you would provide, that we would expect great things from you and attempt great things for you. Father, we ask that you bring the unsaved unto Jesus Christ until our Lord shall come. Amen.